Catholicism or Eastern Orthodoxy. When I was a Protestant and I was learning about church history and the sacraments, this was a big decision for me. Should I become Eastern Orthodox? They claim to have apostolic succession, all seven sacraments, or become a Roman Catholic. And obviously I became a Roman Catholic, but I'm joined with someone you're familiar with here on the Taylor Marshall Show, and that is Timothy Flanders at Meaning of Catholic. And he actually became Eastern Orthodox and then became Catholic. So we're going to talk about his journey today and why he became a Catholic and left behind the Eastern Orthodox Church. So welcome, Timothy. Praise to Jesus Christ, my brother. Thanks for okay, being Maria. here. Well, before we get into this, this is going to be a great show. Um, let's say a prayer. We'll do the um, Our Father in Latin because we're Roman Catholics. And do you want to do the second half, or do you want me to do the whole thing, Timothy? Sure. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. In nomine Patris et Fidii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Pater Noster, qui est in Celi, Sanctificator nomen Tuum, advenia Regnum Tuum, fiat voluntas Tua, sicut in Cielo et in Terra. Panem Nostrum quotidianum da nobis hodie, et dimite nobis debita nostra, sicut in nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos induca in tentationem, se libera nos amalo. Amen. Amen. In nomine Patris et Fidii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. All holy popes. Amen. Pray for us. Pray for us. All right. Well, here we are. I'm I'm still rocking my green screen backdrop here because we're still cleaning up after Easter. I don't oh, Easter, Christmas. I don't want everybody to see all my decorations are just thrown out everywhere. It's kind of embarrassing. So I'm rocking the green screen. If I want, if I turn it off, here's what it looks like. Boom. And as I showed yesterday, I've got all kinds of cool effects that we could just do, but I'll keep it on the blue. <laughs> I thought about uh, Timothy. I thought about putting like a Eastern Orthodox patriarch behind me or like. Hagia Sophia. Well, you could do like. that. That's nice. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thought it might be distracting. So, <laughs> okay. So, you were raised a Protestant. <clears throat> Correct. Yeah, I was ELCA Lutheran. Um, oh, the and, liberal Lutherans. Well, they weren't as liberal back then. I okay. actually had a. So, there's the LCMS, which is more conservative Lutheran, and yeah, one Missouri of those Senate. pastors was the pastor of our ELCA. So, at the time, they were kind of buddy buddy. Okay. Now the ELCA has totally drank the Kool-Aid, but yeah. um, at the time, they actually had a pretty high liturgical life relative to Protestants. Um, okay. You know, like they were chanting the pre the Dominus Fobiscum, not in Latin, but they would chant it just right. as the Romans do. Um, so, and they sang a lot of Vatican II Catholic hymns. Um, so for is what it's good? worth, um, <laughs> it's better than... <laughs> Lutheran qua, qua Lutheran hymns. I, I don't I know. Mean, I mean, the Lutherans have some <laughs> have some decent ones, man. Well, yeah. I mean, if you go, if you go, I mean, I'm a big fan of Bach, so get definitely got a soft spot for Bach. Yeah. But uh, yeah. I mean, but anyways, that there's so at the ELCA Lutheran Church there was uh, a strong liturgical life relative to Protestants. I mean, most Protestants don't have a weekly communion or any type of chanting or right. any. Thing like that. I mean, Advent, Lent, you know, bunch of Marty Haugen. Um, so, <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's pretty high. I mean, it's not like you're you're you were the highest, really. Your yeah. I mean, I, we were. Or, I was before I became Catholic. I was a high church Anglican or Anglo Catholic. So, you know, we went to confession. Uh, we chanted. Um, you know, we did plain song, which is kind of an Anglican form of Gregorian chant. Uh, we did incense and genuflections and ad orientum and right everything and uh kneeling at an altar rail root screen stained glass no 1960s novus ordo anything yeah we had a uh we received communion standing but then there was an altar rail that most people would go to after communion okay. and kneel so anyways i mean it was the point is it's it it, it was higher than you know your rock band type right. of thing that's popular nowadays and i was blessed with very pious evangelical parents who um raised me to love jesus um and uh so they were just very great i blessed with very great parents you know um loved me and and raised me reading the bible and so um <clears throat> but and i was baptized as a as a lutheran uh you know valid baptism obviously as a lutheran as a baby so I was reared in this Lutheran church, and uh, in high school, I became 
uh, you know, a punk teenager. And if you're really religious and you become a punk teacher, teenager, at least for me, I became a Baptist at that point. So okay. I, I uh, rejected my infant baptism. I sought adult baptism. So I got baptized again. <clears throat> and uh, which we should tell everyone. I mean, maybe you weren't culpable, but that is a sacrilege. People don't know that. A lot of teenagers, like they, they ne never told as a child, if you get baptized again, that's a sacrilege. And this is actually a very important point that we need to get back to once we get to Eastern Orthodoxy, because that's a big, huge Bingo. controversy over there. So we'll <laughs> put that on pause for a second. Um, but yeah, be, getting a bap, you know, being a Baptist, I was the worst form of Baptist, just really, you know, prideful and stuck up and what, what my friend would call a fundagelical, where, mm -hmm. you know, just kind of converted everybody. And that was when I became really anti-Catholic. And I think it's interesting because my parents were never really anti-Catholic. They were pretty open-minded. They've always been pretty open-minded all through my journey. Um, so they never really taught me that, but I just kind of grew that way. And I think part of that, which we'll get into is just the fact that <clears throat> Catholicism stands against everything that original sin gives you. It, it's just everything that you're sort of inclined to Catholicism stands against that. And so you just, I think just sort of naturally, or, you know, in the American Protestant culture, it's easy to be just become naturally anti-Catholic, so-called so naturally, you know, right. uh, without really thinking too much about it or being taught that. I mean, I just became really anti-Catholic because Catholicism is anti-pride. So the more prideful you are, the more anti-Catholic you're going to be. And that was my experience at least. So, so yeah, high school, <clears throat> I mean, there's not much to say there, but college, I, I went to, um, now, hold on before we move okay. on. Were you like, I don't on. know your age, but I, like, were you listening to like MXPX and that kind of stuff? <laughs> Tooth and nail. Chris, Christian rock. Yeah. Christian yeah. rap rock and all that. Yeah, yeah. I was into DC talk. That was my jam. DC back talk. In the, day. the Jesus freak uh -huh. album. Right. I mean, to their credit, I, I like their <clears throat> completely shame, shameless, shameless Christianity. You know, they're, they're completely, I don't care, you know, Jesus Christ is Lord, which is more than many of us can say. Many, I mean, unfortunately, the state we're in. But yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it's really Protestant. In my experience, I've, I've, been, uh, I've been traveling around the world a bit. And I've been with a lot of Protestants. I've been Protestant most of my life. And <clears throat> most of it sort of breaks down into either an emotional attachment or an emotional stimulation on the one hand or an intellectual stimulation on the other. And it's just sort of a back and forth between like in, in a worship service that, you know, they have like, you know, half an hour of emotional rock music and then half an hour of a, you know, great Bible study that's very intellectual and right. interesting and so that's been my experience, and I think that that's the trap that, and even even Catholics can get into this. It's just a sentimentality, an emotionalism, where we think that we're growing spiritually um, when we're just having an emotional experience. Uh, you know, it's not we're not actually overcoming sin or acquiring virtue or things of that nature. But so that was the nature of my spirituality. Um, but there's still actual graces given to me by His mercy. Um, that uh, continued to draw me, and there was there were these little just just uh, questions in the back of my mind, like why exactly, why are we worshiping or believing in the way that was just kind of invented 50, 500 years ago? Why is this just so new? Um, what happened during these thousand years? And that just didn't really quite make sense. And I was, even though I was a very fundagelical, prideful Baptist, I was still a lover of truth and I, I was exploring world religions and, and reading about that. I mean, I read all the anti-Catholic books about Catholicism, but I, I still read into other religions and, and certainly found more intellectual grounding because it, I could see the falsehood in, in all the other religions. Um, you know, so, so when I go to college, college is generally where you either lose your faith or you find your faith for real. I think it, in general. And that was when I, I was opened up to the rest of the world. Um, I studied, started studying Greek at that time. I, uh, became a lot more open-minded as a Christian towards other Christians. Um, and the, the big turning point for me was the Mormons actually. Um, I, 
I got, you know, Mormons come after you and I was a lover of truth. I'm like, okay, let's talk. You know, what, what do you have to say for yourself? And, um, I found out that they don't believe in the Nicene Creed. And as a Lutheran, I knew the Nicene Creed mainly was the Apostles Creed, but I knew that, uh, you know, that's an old creed that goes back many years. And I thought, well, why don't you believe in the Nicene Creed? That doesn't make sense. And, uh, and then they gave me their story that, you know, they, the church fell away and then Joseph Smith brought it back and all this nonsense. Right. And that made no sense to me at all because, I mean, what happened for 1800 years until Joseph Smith can't, I mean, that's, that's ridiculous. It, yeah. it just sort of didn't make any sense. And then I just, that's really the fulcrum of becoming Catholic right there. And, uh, so then you start to question, well, what about, uh, what about infant baptism? What about the real presence of Christ and the Eucharist? I mean, once you start that, then then uh, it just starts to go from there. Now, the but I had one big stop before Eastern Orthodoxy, and that was I got really into Messianic Judaism and the Protestant version, um, where basically a bunch of rabbinical Jews accepted Jesus Christ, but they wanted to continue being rabbinical Jews, and this particular sect that I was a part of was very Judaizing. They believed that Gentiles had to follow the Torah and everything. So uh, wow. I got really into that. Yeah. <laughs> um, There's a good was, book on that, Timothy. It's called Galatians. <laughs> 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 yeah, they, they somehow figure out how to get, get right. past that. I don't know. But um, I was basically trying to deal with the Old Testament that says the Sabbath laws are eternal. You know, these, this is an eternal commandment to keep the Sabbath or such things like that, where, you know, they were saying, well, hey, this is an eternal commandment. Why are you disobeying the commandment? And at the same time, I was involved with uh, InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, which is among Protestant groups, I think one of the best, in my opinion, um, because they, they had a, a strong understanding of culture and how culture interacts with differences and they trained me to really kind of be more open-minded and I got to be a part of a group that went to Egypt on a, uh, just kind of a mission trip that lived, we lived in Egypt in the slums of Cairo. And, uh, that was the first encounter that I really had with the Orthodox church. Now this is for those of you who don't know, this is, um, the non Chalcedonian Orthodox. So there's 14 plus or minus Chalcedonian Orthodox churches. And then there's, um, six or seven, I don't remember, I think it's seven, non-Chalcedonian churches. And then there's a third group called the Assyrian church. So the Eastern churches have many different schisms among themselves. And we can talk about that, but I, I encountered the Eastern churches in Egypt, the Copts. And, um, that was really revolutionary because I was really struggling spiritually with the division of the church, trying to figure out this Messianic Judaism. Is that kind of the truth because it's sort of original, you know, or is it this, Eastern Orthodoxy, that seems very early. So I was doing a lot of reading with that. And I had an, you know, lack of a better word, encounter, I guess, you know, an experience of conversion in the divine liturgy with the, the numerous Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. And it was just an experience of contrition yeah. of my own sin. And I think I was, I was spending so much time trying to figure out why is the church divided? And I felt God telling me that the reason was me. And my own pride. That was the reason that the church was divided. And I, I need not look further than that. And I, so I had a, a con, some kind of conversion um, at that time that uh, ultimately I rejected Messianic Judaism because I was reading up on it and I was actually at one of their services and they, they prayed the, uh, the curse against the heretics. Are you familiar with this? Yes. So, mm -hmm. so there's a, uh, Somewhere along the line, the rabbinic Jews added a curse against the Christians in their synagogue service, which is not explicit to Christians, but many understand it to be directed towards the Christians who were Jews at the time who were in the synagogue in, you know, the year 7, 80, 90, 100, whatever. So they added this curse against them, curse the heretics, anathema to the heretics or whatever. And they prayed this, and I had read about this, and I thought— this, this is just insane. I, I just realized, sort of had a moment of truth, and I realized it just wasn't adding up. The other factor was that 
rabbinical Jews reject they really they say that they follow the Torah, but really they reject the temple sacrifice and the priesthood. Um or more or less, obviously, you know, there's different opinions about that, but there's um, a strong emphasis on eating kashrut and following these mitzvot about, um, you know, sort of these little things. But I thought of the verse when our Lord says, you have forsaken the greater matters of the law. Mm. And I thought of the the priesthood and the sacrifice and how there, you know, without blood, there is no forgiveness. And that's when I, when it really clicked that there was reading about this and a lot of history aside, um, that there was in the new covenant, there is the priesthood of Melchizedek, the, according to Christ, you know, and the sacrifice. And, and so, and then there was this juridical authority to bind and loose and, uh, make these pronouncements regarding certain mitzvot of the Torah, uh, which can be aggregated and those which cannot. So, <clears throat> So basically, kind of cutting to the chase, uh, I became Eastern Orthodox. Um, 2009, my coming to the end of my college career, um, 2009, I became a catechumen for a year, year and a half. And then I came, I became Eastern Orthodox in the Antiochian Orthodox Church. I was charismated, so that's confirmation. Um, in, uh, so it was Pascha, it was Easter of 2010 when that finally went through. So that's my journey to Eastern Orthodoxy so far. <laughs> right, now, which um, which jurisdiction did you join? Yeah, so, it's, so um, for those who are not familiar, there are many, in America especially, there are many different jurisdictions of the Orthodox Church. There's not only these schisms between the Chalcedonian and non-Chalcedonian, but there's also within the Chalcedonia, then there's, there's the Antiochian, which is like, uh, from Antioch, Arab, there is uh, Greek, Greek Orthodox, you've probably heard of Greek Orthodox, maybe you've heard of Russian Orthodox as well. So I joined the Antiochian Orthodox, which is interesting because we'll get into this, but um, the Eastern Orthodox churches, the Chalcedonian Orthodox churches, are currently in a formal schism between Moscow in general, on the one hand, and the Ecumenical Patriarch, the Greek Orthodox, on the other, in general. There's other complications there, obviously, but and in general, both of these churches, um, they have a rivalry that's been going on for centuries. And Antioch is sort of more or less in the middle there. So the Antiochian Orthodox can be, in general, a little bit less um, into those rivalries. Um, sometimes they're, they're a little bit less anti-Catholic as well. So, But I, I was influenced by a number of different Orthodox priests um, who had also different opinions about Rome and and things. So I did join the Antiochian Orthodox. Um, I was studying Arabic as well. And so I, I mean, I'd been to Egypt and everything. So I, I was really at home with um, the Arabs, Arab Christians. So uh, yeah, Antioch, that's where I went. Um, <clears throat> so um, I, I kind of want to get into it. Maybe we should wait on and get your full story because I want to talk about currently, as I understand it, the Greek Orthodox in Constantinople are in a formal schism with Moscow and the Russian Orthodox Church. Real quick, where does Antioch, the Antiochian Orthodox, fit in with that? Are they kind of in a quasi-communion with both? Yeah, what we're going to get into is the even the Chalcedonian Orthodox churches are not one church. Yeah, And this has been... This has been really the biggest barrier between uh, the Roman Catholic and the Orthodox ecumenical dialogue of any kind of union that they could make is is the Orthodox among themselves disagree. Um, <clears throat> so Antioch, I've heard, actually heard f different things, and honestly, I haven't followed it closely because it's just sort of tiresome to me at this point. Um, <laughs> but I have heard that... Um, the Antioch is some of the communion goes one way, but not the other. So the anti the ecumenical patriarch apparently is in communion with Russia, but then Russia is not in communion with the ecumenical patriarch. So, and I think Antioch is with the ecumenical patriarch, if I'm not mistaken. Um, somebody can probably correct me, maybe in the comments or whatever. But uh, I believe they're with the ecumenical patriarch in communion with Moscow, but Moscow is not in communion with them. So, generally, that doesn't make sense. But okay. 
So no, it doesn't make sense. So, um, so I basically that uh, that we'll we'll get into why that's important right. and what sort of hit me. But I I became Eastern Orthodox and I was. I, I basically bought into a lot of what's really what's really bad is that a lot of Protestants become Eastern Orthodox so that they can have an ancient faith but still be anti-Roman. Yeah. And a lot of them will then write books which will misrepresent the Eastern Orthodox churches in an anti-Roman way. Let me give you an example. So many Orthodox, you can read famous essays online, which, which draw a strong distinction between uh, the Eastern Orthodox conception of God, which is um, the lover of mankind, versus the Western conception, which is uh, judgment and uh, wrath and things like that. That's, that's a completely false distinction. Um, if, if you, when, when, when you start to, I mean, you could just read just in the Divine Liturgy, there's, there's the uh, Sunday of Last Judgment. Uh, in the pre-Lent season, um, there's all sorts of things like that. I mean, it's it's just really not. That's just a completely false characterization of East and West. And um, as I learned more, I just began to um, see that there were these inconsistencies with what they were saying Eastern Orthodox really taught. Because because you could say, hey, the Eastern Orthodox Church rejects the Immaculate Conception. Um, Sergei Bol- Bolgakov writes that, but then uh, Kalistos Ware writes. And admits that, well, hey, before 1854, uh, you know, Palamas and Photius, they kind of taught the Immaculate Conception or other saints did that. But then after 1854, now we're totally against it, you right. know. And uh, so, well, what happened in 1854? Well, Rome dogmatized the Immaculate Conception. So, so now they're against it. So so it's um, what what you what you get. And this is around this time when I started doing a, an online program with the Catholic University of Ukraine. And I was very ecumenical, I guess, in a, in a good sense, meaning, um, trying to at least talk it out and trying to, you know, work out some differences. And I think to be fair, there are certain things that can be worked out. Um, among the Chalcedonians, they actually have all but worked out their division with the non-Chalcedonians through just talking it out. And that's a whole other controversy, but yeah, yeah. I've been curious about that because I've heard that when Eastern Orthodox travel, if, for example, you know, near the hotel is a Coptic Orthodox church, which is non-Chalcedonian, Miaphysite, they'll go there. Is that right? And well, vice versa. I mean, it's basically, yeah. Um, I, and that would, to be fair, that would kind of hold for, like, for Catholics, even if we were in a grave situation, you know, like we were, like, had to get the sacrament somehow, we could go to an Eastern Orthodox church priest you know if we had to um i wouldn't you wouldn't no well it's, uh there's a certain amount of grave cause um that has been allowed over the years between right. um the churches like you know danger of death type of thing yeah but um the yeah in general in general there is a a communal sharing um especially in the diaspora like in america europe right um so yeah, I, we had cops at our Antiochian church, um, but it's not always it's not always universal. That's that's really the thing. There's no universal law, canonical, uh, you know, law. There's no um, universal um, jurisdictional um, law that's going to unify all that. Um, it's going to be up to the ultimately up to the priest to to commune you or not. Um, but in general, that, that type of thing does happen, especially in American Europe. Um, but the, basically what happens, what happened was the, um, Chalcedonian and non-Chalcedonians got together in the sixties and seventies and they realized that, um, the language that they were using was ultimately kind of the same as what they were kind of concluding. And so they kind of, kind of agreed that they both had the Orthodox faith, but, they couldn't work out their differences because they are they can't call an ecumenical council to um, sort of abrogate some of the things that the fourth ecumenical council said. Because um, <clears throat> the fourth ecumenical council, which is on the books, anathematizes their saints and their doctors, the, the non-Chalcedonians. So, right. which we accept as Catholics. And even That's- moreover, I, I think that the 
not only would the non-Chalcedonian Miaphysites have trouble with the Fourth Fourth Council, but I think technically, wouldn't they also be a monothelite? Well, yeah, that's the the, the monothelite. Uh, Just for people watching, monothelite is the error, the theological heresy that Christ only has one energy or one will, whereas the Catholic Church teaches correctly that Christ has two energies or two wills, the divine will and the human will. But I, I think the non-Chalcedonians would reject even that. Well, it's it's kind of it's it's a hard, hard question because I think some would, some won't. Um, the whole controversy came about because the emperor was trying to make peace with the Miaphysites. Right. And so they're trying to find these sort of vague formulas to to reconcile the whole empire. And, and then you have the Mohammedans invading later. So it's just kind of a big mess that they're trying to work out. And Rome's in the Rome's over here saying, why are you, what are you doing? Why are you changing all these things? You know, um, so it's basically um, it's a big challenge to the Chalcedonians because the non-Chalcedonians, um, m- many of them want to reconcile, but then you have Moscow or Athos against it because the Fourth Ecumenical Council anathematizes them. So, anyways, the the big issue here that I began to realize as an Eastern Orthodox was that there is no ecumenical universal authority, right. and that's really kind of what it comes down to is that. The Chalcedonian Orthodox churches say, we are the church of the seven councils, and they do hold to all the seven councils. But everything after that, what they don't have is they don't have the power of any of those seven councils. They don't have the power to call an ecumenical council, make a unified, universally binding canonical decision, make canons, make canon law like they used to, and they can't resolve these things. And so anybody who comes to you and says, hey, well, the Orthodox Church teaches this about the Filioque, or this about the Immaculate Conception, or this about that, or whatever. Since 787, there's really not a unified, universal binding decision or, or teaching on those things. Even polemism, which was more or less worked out by them, they still they can't agree whether or not distinction of, distinctions of essence and energies are formal or material, or what are they exactly. So yeah. it's... It's just a big mess. And and coming back to baptism, that was really mm-hmm. the biggest thing. Because basically, if you're if you're a baptized Protestant, as I was, valid baptism, you go to Antioch and they'll chrismate you. So you're you're receiving confirmation. It's a valid sacrament. But if you do the same thing, you go to Mount Athos, they're gonna rebaptize you because they don't accept your baptism. They think your baptism is invalid. Whereas right. Moscow if you go to Moscow Patriarchate, they might give you an option. Say, do you want to be rebaptized? Don't you? Um, and these are all things I've I've experienced personally. I know these things that I've experienced. And what they do is they basically say, well, this is all economia, um, which is their concept of saying, well, we all accept each other's baptism and sacraments. So whatever you accept over there in Antioch, we'll accept over here in Russia. So we're not gonna, we're going to commune you in Russia if you come. But if you would have come to us in the beginning, we would have rebaptized you or things like that. So. Right. This is a complete mess, and the reason is because this type of thing was a controversy in the third century. Yes, this was like goes way back to. It was like Saint Cyprian. This is like yeah, Cyprian had a disagreement with Pope Stephen. They they worked it out, and the church since that time has has basically rebaptized some people, like the Mormons. They're going to rebaptize a Mormon because it's an invalid baptism, but they're not going to rebaptize a you know, Lutheran, because they believe in the Trinity and it's a valid baptism. So that's the, the, the Roman Catholic Church has a universal canonical procedure for that. And baptism is the, is the, uh, bar- is the, is the boundary of the church. That's how you become a Christian. That's how you become part of the church. So how can the Orthodox churches be one church if they can't even figure out which baptisms are which, which baptisms are real and which, which are not? And they just sort of Oh, it's economia. And then they just leave it at that. And that's 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 not the way of the seven councils is what yeah, I it, we, it, it's kind of interesting. I think in 2020, I see what Francis is doing. Pope Francis is he's he seems part of his agenda of his pontificate is to take the Eastern Orthodox idea of economia. And use that on Catholic theology and morality. So it, it's going to introduce sort of a local relativism 
that Eastern Orthodoxy is experiencing, which is a negative, right? Yeah. So you might have one bishop conference that says, well, if you've been divorced and remarried and you're waiting on your annulment, you can receive communion. And you might have another conference that says, well, you need to wait till it's totally complete. And you have another conference that doesn't matter, receive communion anyway. Right? Yeah, it's all exactly, sort of dispens yeah, I mean, the Latin term right. is dispen dispensation. But it's right. kind of the same thing that mercy and discernment and accompaniment is kind of just a flagged version of economia. Yeah, and you can you can receive a dispensation for something that's not intrinsically evil. You know, you can receive a right. dispensation for not going to mass on Sunday if you're sick or whatever, or there's a you know a grave cause. You can not go to mass on Sunday. It's not a mortal sin in that case. But they apply economia to contraception. To right. I mean, they've been divorcing and remarrying. They, this is one of the most bizarre things. So if any Catholics who think that the grass is greener in East consider that, and I, um, if, if you look up, um, I'll, I'll comment on the, with a link to this, but I have the references to Caliso's Ware's book. So like when he published it in 65 or whatever, he said the, ca the contraception is forbidden in the Orthodox church, period. That was it. And then when he revised it in 1993, he said, Contraception is a, is a disputed question among the Orthodox. So they went from 1960, right. it's forbidden, now it's disputed, now it's allowed. When I was catechized, my priest, my Orthodox priest said, me, said to me that sometimes contraception is okay. Right. Um, and further, they have this, the Chalcedonians have this bizarre rule that no one can explain to me. I, I, I don't even know. It, it comes from the 10th century controversy regarding Emperor Leo VI. But for some reason, they allow someone to de re divorce their spouse and then remarry a new spouse while their other spouse is still living. And then they can do that a total of three times. And then on the fourth marriage, you cannot take another spouse. That's it. That's the end. <laughs> and More than why this is, why this is, I mean, not, you should have stopped. <laughs> I mean, you can't even go one, but right. the bizarre, here's the weird thing. Emperor Leo's cake, Leo the sixth, his wives actually died each time. He okay. married a woman, she died. And then he married again, because at the time there was a strong preference for never marrying again, even right. if you were a widower. But the Pope said, yes, it's you know it's a valid marriage if you remarry after your wife dies. Wait, you know, the Pope you, said this? Yeah, the Pope, Pope allowed, no, the Pope allowed a remarriage after death right. of the spouse. Right. right, that's what the Pope allowed in the 10th century. Yeah. Till so death she, do us part. Yeah, the Pope allowed a remarriage after death. So. You know, when you when your spouse dies, your marriage is over. You can remarry another. You know, you know, you can remarry another spouse. But somehow, somewhere along the line, the Orthodox churches transfer that into now you can remarry while your spouse is still living, and somehow that right. And it's 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 locked in a bunch of Greek sources that no one has yet to unlock. And maybe somebody in the comments who's gotten through all these Greek sources can explain how that even happened. But but that's actually yeah, because what Casper Christ our Lord clearly said four times. <laughs> <laughs> no, he didn't. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just completely arbitrary. And right. like John Meindorf, who is a, a big yep. Orthodox writer, he admits this. He says, hey, this is arbitrary. It's, there's no completely. theological reason for these four marriages. And it's really locked up in the the emperors. Um, this is what you, if you really study Orthodoxy, you find out that there is a, uh, Caesaro papism. It's it's like the emperor is a very sacred figure who um, sort of helped create a lot of this. Now, before I forget, I want to recommend this. This is the book that really changed my whole mm. life. In this, this is Vladimir Soloviev, Russia, Russia and the Universal Church. It's a good book. Um, this guy, I remember reading him after I just sort of discovered some of this. Was uh, I, I, I just read it in like 24 hours. It was, it was um, it's a pretty short book too. And you can get it for free online too. I've got a link on my website for it. Um, but he just talks about <clears throat> um, how there, there is this melding. There's this melding with the political state in Orthodoxy um, where the state is, is this sacred um, uh, sacred. And, and, you know, we, we have similar things in Catholicism, but we, we had the investiture controversy, which clearly yeah. uh, ratified that, the church is um, distinct but not separated from the state, and the church is also over the state in in some senses. Um, so, so yeah, the there is that uh, 
so the grass is not greener is what I'm trying to say is that Casper actually took this practice of remarriage and divorce and remarriage from the Orthodox church. And he's the one who's wanting, he's been this whole controversy, Amoris Laetitia and everything is coming from Casper who got it from the Eastern Orthodox. He's, he's trying to bring this, this sort of loose morality into the Catholic church. So, but what I would, what I would credit most in the Eastern Orthodox church for opening my eyes was really going to confession and going to confession made me realize how much I was blinded by my pride. Mm. Uh, I, I had not really, um, the, the biggest, if you take nothing, anybody listening who's considering East or whatever, if you take nothing away from this, take this. And that is that the question of the Roman primacy is not an objective question in the sense that we are inclined by original sin uh, against the Roman primacy. It's like talking to, talking about God to an atheist. Like it's not it's not a an objective thing that oh we can just. It's like um, it's not like studying frogs. Like determining a scientific question. It's it's it has a radical impact on your life. Right. This question, answering this question. So we we're, we're original sin inclines us away from uh, God. It inclines us away from the Roman primacy because ultimately the Roman primacy checks our pride. It's, it's the buck stops at some point. When you're Orthodox, what you can do is you can basically just become a scholar and you read all the fathers and you just kind of make your, your own decision about all these disputed questions. Is contraception wrong or is it not? Well, you can just read all the fathers and kind of come to your own conclusion. And ultimately your own, you are in, uh, you're, you're not safe from your pride. I guess that's, that's what I found out is I, I'm not safe from my pride here. I'm, I'm, I'm prideful, I'm consumed with myself, and in Eastern Orthodoxy, I, I have to sort of continue to be a Protestant in some ways. I have to continue to make up my own mind about all these little things um, that the church has already worked out such a, a great body of, of uh, doctrine and of faith and morals. And so many of these questions of the Eastern Orthodox are 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 arguing over. We've already worked out these things because there's a magisterium, there's an ecumenical church, there's a, a universal binding authority. So <clears throat> that was really what hit me was that, that uh, it's not a it's not a question that you can just be absolutely objective about because you're inclined against it. You don't want the papacy to be real. You want to live in your own world and your own bubble and just go to decide your own faith and your, and your own doctrine. And, and that's what you can do as an Eastern Orthodox. And that's what I realized that was the the big turning point for me. <clears throat> yeah. So, I mean, in my uh, in my book Infiltration, at the end, I say, look, the Catholic Church is in the greatest controversy that it's ever been in in two thousand years. That's my belief. As we turn into this next year, I, I'm confirmed in that belief. Um, and I give options. I'm like, hey, you know what? You can maybe we should reject Catholicism. You know, should we become atheists and just this whole thing was a joke? Should we become evangelical Protestants? Should we become Sedeve Contis? Should we become Eastern Orthodox? And I kind of lay out each of those, you know, what would be the benefits of them and why each of them are wrong. And, and my conclusion is in 2019, 2020, moving forward, the answer is to be a traditional Catholic, recognize the hierarchy, recognize the Pope, but resist error, resist modernism. That's my position still. Um, and not to become a set of a contest and not to become Eastern Orthodox. So I know there are people, I see people in the comments saying, I've already left the Catholic Church, it's a joke, I'm Eastern Orthodox. There are other people saying, Francis is, is so horrible, I'm becoming Eastern Orthodox, who needs the Pope? What would you say to them, Timothy Flanders? Well, I would say that your Eastern Orthodox saints teach the papacy. Mm -hmm. So you have to confront St. Leo, who is your saint, who just read his writings, if if the papacy is a heresy, then your own saint is a heretic. Right. Uh, you know, you you that's what you have to confront. And there's I mean, basically it, it just comes down to what the saints teach. The saints teach the papacy. Um now it's not uh, you know, if you read Newman on this, he's really good because he, he talks about how even in the pre Nicene period, before Nicaea, there were so many references to uh, Roman primacy among the saints at that time, which even outnumber the references to the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Right. There's more <laughs> evidence for the papacy. And even if you read uh, 
a big book for me was Adrian Fortescue, The Early Papacy. And he just yeah. talks about zero to 451. And he says, there are more Trinitarian controversies among the pre-Nicene fathers than there are papal controversies. I mean, right. there's, there's so many strong statements from these popes. I mean, you have St. Victor, uh, what is he, 140? I mean, yep. these, these popes are, are acting with a universal jurisdiction right out of the gate, basically. In terms of ecclesiastical history, this is right out of the gate. I mean, you get like 50 years after the apostles, that's like immediately, you know? And so you, what you have is you have the Eastern Orthodox who are, they're, they're championing icons, but there's more iconoclastic controversy among the fathers than there are papal controversy. I mean, so they're not being consistent with their evidence. And that goes back to the fact that original sin inclines us against the papacy. They don't want, we don't want this evidence to say that the papacy is real. We don't want that because then we can be free to do our own thing. But basically what I would say to anybody who wants to go east is um, the other factor is um, charity, um, the bond of charity in, in communion with Rome um, in the crisis. Uh, we don't go into schism. We don't choose to just break off and go to a, um, this schismatic church. Um, we stick together as brothers and we fight for this. And that's how our fathers have always dealt with the crisis is like this. And so, you know, schism is a sin against charity and you sin against charity, you go to hell. That's a mortal sin. That's what mortal sin is, just destruction of charity in the soul. So, um, you, you, you might get more warm and fuzzies because you won't have to deal with liturgical madness because you can get a bunch of Byzantine chant or whatever, but your, your beautiful liturgy is not going to, your, a beautiful liturgy is not, a beautiful liturgy is a stench in the nostrils of the Lord almighty. If you reject charity, if you're offering, right. if you're offering a perfect, whatever, beautiful sacrifice, but you reject, you hate your brother, you reject your, your prideful, you reject charity. That's, that's unacceptable. You know, um, you, you need to keep the bond of charity with your brothers and you need to fight. That's what all our fathers did who died Catholics. So that's what I have to say. Um, looking at the evidence and being as objective as we can, um, the evidence shows that the Eastern Orthodox saints teach the papacy. Yeah. Um, now it's not, it's not as clear in certain instances, like St. Cyprian kind of rebels against the papacy or, or different instances like that and there, there's yeah, isolated over cases baptism <laughs> <laughs> so um so there's a there's controversy it's not it's not like a open and shut case but you if you look at it and you object here's here's what i'll plug is um eric ibarra.com i think eric ibarra is one of the best apologists out there for rome specifically addressing eastern orthodox um, and he has just loads of evidence. You just go over and over. Um, and, uh, reason and theology has some debates, Eastern Orthodox versus Catholic reason and theology, um, YouTube show. So, um, yeah, that, I mean, that's what I would say. I mean, this is, we need to take up the mantle of our fathers, take up the cross of suffering that all our fathers took and died Catholics. We need to take, we need to take it up manfully, be a man of God, take up the suffering of the cross, die Catholic. Yeah. You know, it's you, you mentioned Pope uh, St. Victor, who was in the second century. I think he died around in the 190s. But he, over the Quarto Deciman controversy, the dating of Easter, he was going to excommunicate the province of Asia Minor. And if you, if you read the church history, they don't say you don't have that authority. This is pre-Constantinian. They say you shouldn't do this. Right. It's presumed that he can. I mean, he also excommunicated a guy named Theodotus, who was in Byzantium, proto or pre Constantinople. He excommunicated him because he was teaching pre Arianism. He was saying Christ wasn't fully divine. So here we have a pope excommunicating a guy over in Asia Minor. This that is all like, pre Constantine, one nineties. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the looks Apostle like John has only been dead for a hundred years. <laughs> Right, and right. you've got the Pope in Rome threatening excommunication of hundreds of thousands of people over the date of Easter. He certainly believes that he has the keys of Peter, that he's the vicar of Christ, that he's the successor of St. Peter, and everyone else believes it too. So in order to—the Eastern Orthodox have to maintain 
basically that the Western churches went off the rails like almost immediately. You know, the popes just kind of, they just became schismatic heretics immediately. Like just a few generations out of the apostle, immediately they're just going off the oh, rails. By 190. Right. And then, and then it gets really bad with Augustine because, oh, Augustine, he's just, oh, he's terrible. He's just a crazy Latin erroneous. He teaches in the filioque and original sin and all this stuff. And, and then they have to further believe that Augustine just went off the rails, totally went off the rails. And, uh, they, they, they basically have to maintain this because, they maintain that Augustine is teaching something contrary to what St. John Chrysostom and St. Basil and, and all the Cappadocian fathers taught, you know. And so they have to maintain that just essentially the Western churches fell away very quickly. And it was only the Chalcedonian Orthodox that continued to put up the, took up this mantle. But I think when you look at the history, it's a lot more complex. <clears throat> there was a very strong political... Uh, force with the rise of Constantinople as this other sea, because originally you had uh, Rome, Alexandria, and Antioch as the the Petrine seas, but then by the Second Ecumenical Council you have Constantinople rising as as a another force of power, and that force of power was the source of the tension among other things of these all these battles through these seven Ecumenical Councils. So that's the thing that the Orthodox just completely ignore. They don't really address that. They just sort of, oh, we all agreed on the Pentarchy. We all agreed on Constantinople. It was all sort of agreed, but it's not the case. Um, so the history is complex. You know, everybody wants the history to be black and white. Every partisan just wants, oh, it's just a black and white history. It's clearly this or clearly that. Um, it's, history is far more complex than all of its partisans want it to be. Um, yeah, and that's and that's just what I found is that I couldn't uh, I couldn't really claim that Saint Leo was a heretic. I couldn't claim that Saint Saint Augustine was a heretic. That was just it's just ridiculous to me, to uh, for them to and they don't really to be fair to them don't quite claim that you know they claim that he was sort of a pre heretic or whatever pre erroneous or whatever. But I just really couldn't you know all these so called heresies of the West that they claim I could find in the Latin Fathers. So it was like, right. well, this is all straight line right from Augustine and Ambrose, you know, and all them. So I can't really, how can I, how can I fault them for holding to the Latin fathers? That's, you know, that's what was the apostolic deposit in that area, you know? And so it, it just doesn't add up. It doesn't, um, <clears throat> bear out close scrutiny. And that was what I, what I discovered. And what I discovered was that my own pride was really the thing blinding me to that. So, <clears throat> I, I, so I came into communion with Rome in <clears throat> 2013, shortly before Pope Francis was elected, actually. <laughs> and uh, You came in under V16. Um, you know, I, I can't remember, actually, if he had actually resigned at that time. I, I don't recall exactly the chronology. But, but he, he resigned, I think, was it February of 2013? I can't. Yeah, the announcement. Um, I think it, now, that I'm, now that I'm remembering, I think it was later in that year that Pasco was like a it was like a, the Eastern Pascha was a, a month later, Easter. <clears throat> I think it was later May. So he was elected in March, I believe, Pope Francis. And then I think I came in in May. Uh, so at the time, <clears throat> so also I, so I had a further transformation. First of all, let me, let me, let me say this. I've never regretted coming to Rome, even with Pope Francis, ever. It's never come through my mind. Um, <clears throat> and the biggest thing is this. On these disputed questions like contraception, um, I mean, what would you say, Taylor? Would you say, I mean, I would say like 90, 90%, 95% or so of all the controversies in Rome right now have already been authoritative, authoritatively settled. I mean, before the council, I mean, all these questions that are arising, yeah. I mean, they've already women's been Women's ordination. Answered. I mean, yeah, you got women's contraception, contra yeah. divorce, divorce and remarriage, <laughs> homosexuality. Uh I mean, that's every, the top stuff right now. No salvation outside the church. I no mean, salvation outside the church, Catholic. which kind of takes care of ecumenism. Uh, I mean, you could, <laughs> what could you say? Like global warming is a totally new, new issue. Global maybe? I don't warming know, is but, not resolved yet. Right. <laughs> that's you accept the, point is, the point is, you don't, you don't, you know, you don't need to go searching. I mean, to a certain extent, you do need to go searching. I mean, you just, well, you just pick up Denziger or, or Ott, Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma, just read it. Or, or Prumer, Manual of Moral Theology, you just read the basic textbooks and you, you got pretty much 95% of all the controversies that are going on. You don't even need to trouble yourself with all these 
these uh, questions. Um, so even in a time of crisis in Rome, I, I'm, I feel at peace because I'm, I'm safe from my pride. I don't have to try to figure out all of these things myself. I just go back to the sources and read what they say and just sort of confirm myself to them. Whereas in Eastern Orthodoxy, if you're wondering about contraception, if you're wondering about immaculate conception, even there's disagreement about the filioque, um, you know, you'll get a different answer depending on which scholar and which bishop and which priest you talk to in Eastern Orthodoxy. So ultimately you are going to come to your own conclusion and you're ultimately your own authority at the end of the day. You're, it's like sola scriptura and add the church fathers on top of that. And you've got Eastern Orthodoxy. And that's the problem is that you're not safe from your pride. You're, you're just, you're still creating your own thing. Whereas in Rome, we, the, like, there's a great line from Ripperger where he says, we only have freedom to form our own opinion about something if the church has never made a judgment on it. So if you go, if you have a question about X, you go into the tradition, you go through all the saints and the doctors and whatever, and you find what they said about X, and then you conform yourself to that and you, you accept that. Unless, of course, you, you know, you were talking about new technology or some question that's never really been answered because it's completely new like okay, cloning. and like yeah like cloning or whatever and then then we can we can have a discussion about it but right. everything else we just take from the tradition we take it and we accept it and we pass it down um and the, you know there's certain moral theology questions that are disputed in certain ways or whatever but um you know it's it's once again, I'm saved from my pride. I can accept what my fathers teach me and, and accept that, you know. Um, so, you, you know, there's, I, uh, there's two things that kept me from being orthodox. The first is I noticed that when I studied the first seven councils, now as an Anglican, I accepted the first seven councils. Like, yeah, the Eastern Orthodox are right. There were seven councils and then Rome messed up, you know, and they went on and did all this crazy stuff. That was my position as an Anglo Catholic. So it's kind of like a, quasi Eastern Orthodox position. But as I studied as a seminarian, the seven ecumenical councils, I noticed two important features. One, there were many, many councils going on. Even councils called by Constantinople, by the emperor. But those seven were ratified for two reasons. The emperor, beginning with Constantine at Nicaea, brought the council together. Now, think about a council. Back then, there's no airplanes. You have to bring, you have to summon bishops from all over the Mediterranean, Christendom, and bring them together for a council. That, that requires money. It also requires authority to just tell a bunch of bishops, get out of your town and report here now. That's imperial authority. A lot of bishops don't want to do that, but when the emperor says you do it, you do it. So that was going on in all the councils. They had to be paid for. They got to be. They got to travel. They need food. They got to bring attendants. They bring with them deacons and priests. They bring entourage. You read the the, the history of the councils. They're bringing people with them. They're they're being housed. They're being fed. This is a major event in the ecumenical council. Secondly. Only the councils that were ratified by the Pope in Rome made it to be ecumenical, right? There's the robber councils, all the other councils going on. There were mm -hmm. councils that were held that, that condemned icons. Mm -hmm. Only those that were ratified by Rome were numbered ecumenical. Now, you ask yourself, why is it that the, the Eastern Orthodox haven't had a council since 7, 787 AD? The reason is twofold. They don't have a pope to ratify. They don't, ever since the 1400s, they don't have an emperor to bankroll and to summon. Who's going to tell the Russian Orthodox Patriarch and the Greek Orthodox Patriarch and the Antiochian, you guys all show up in this city on this date and they're going to show up? Nobody. So to me, I realize that Eastern Orthodoxy is, is basically DOA at this point. It can't. What they say is magisterial authority, ecumenical councils can never happen again unless they restore the Byzantine Imperium and unless they're in communion with Rome. Their magisterial uh, instrument is dead. Right. You know? 
Oh yeah. I mean, <clears throat> that's really what, when I read Soloviev, it was just such an eye opener. He has this great line this, and this is written in about the year 1900. Check out this line. He says, on the day on which the Russian and Greek churches formerly break, break with one another, the whole world will see that the ecumenical Eastern church is a mere fiction and that there exists in the East nothing but isolated national churches. So 100 years ago, he's predicting the schism that's happening right now. And all the Orthodox are fighting against each other because they've never worked out for right. almost a thousand years how to even call a council. Who calls a council? How do you ratify it? How does it have authority? How do you do any of these things? It's not, they do not, they do not have an ecumenical universal church. All they have are these isolated churches and they disagree on various things, including faith and morals, and they disagree on church government, and they're they're not capable of figuring out these things. They've had councils since 787, but what are the status of these councils? Some, very few, very few will claim that some of them are ecumenical. There's a, there's a few who will, but that's right. my experience, a minority view. Um, so they have these other councils, but are they authoritative? Are they binding? Why? To what extent? On what grounds? You know, they, they can't answer anything. It's just a, I mean, this is, unfortunately, it's a big mess. And, you know, they'll, they'll come back to us and say, well, you're a big mess because we're in this crowd. I'd say, yes, we are. Um, but the, here's, here's what I say is that the Roman Catholic Church is united in potency because mm. the Roman Catholic Church has the power to unite everybody. It's right. not doing it. We're in a crisis. I agree. Yeah. But the Rome, you know, Pope Francis could have a massive conversion, please God. Uh, and then suddenly he says, okay, we're all going to come and anathematize all these propositions that are erroneous. Everybody's bound to do it. You know, St. Saint, Saint Pius X did that. He had the oath against modernism. He united the, everybody against modernism. They had to all do it. Everybody was bound to it. They have the power to do that. The fact that they're not doing it, that's another matter. But the fact is the power exists. Right. And that's really, that's what makes the difference is that even in the worst crisis ever, I've never thought twice about being Eastern Orthodox because I know that I would just have to rely so much on my own judgment to be an Eastern Orthodox, to figure out all these different questions that aren't figured out, that haven't been authoritatively decided. So, that, I mean, that's the biggest. Now, the best way they answer this is by saying, one, well, um, the Nicene Church didn't, uh, you know, the pre-Nicene Church didn't have ecumenical councils. So, you know, they were just a holy bunch of holy martyrs and stuff, so they didn't really need an ecumenical council. But when I read the book of Acts, I read that in Acts chapter 15, they made an authoritative binding decision on the whole church. It's not, they don't call that an ecumenical council, but it was an, it was, uh, it was a universal binding um, decision. And you, when you look in the Greek, Acts 16, 4, it says they, they went through all the cities and they delivered the dogmas which were decreed by the apostles and priests for them to obey. And that's what the Greek says. You don't really, you don't really get this except in, in the, uh, in the Dewey Reams really, which is you got to come here. If you read my book, we'll go through all those details of the, the Greek and Latin right there. But, um, there's an authoritative decision that's being made. It's a, a apostolic, it's authoritative. Um, so I see this in the very beginning and I, and it, this doesn't hold water. Oh, uh, you know, we're just, we don't need an ecumenical council. Um, you know, or they just say, well, Hey, well, there's no universal heresies that we need, really need to call a council. It's not necessary right now. Well, that's just, that's even worse. I mean, it's like <laughs> you're joking, right? I mean, if you think Rome is, if you think Rome is in heresy, that's 1 billion heretics running around the earth. I mean, you shouldn't you anathematize these, these heretics, but no. So I, I've never heard a, uh, I've never heard a, a satisfactory answer because there isn't one. Um, the answer is Rome, and um, that's the long and short of it. There's there's no Orthodox Church. There's just isolated national churches with different doctrines and different faith and morals. And ultimately, you have to die trusting in yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a, that's a frightful idea to to yeah. die trusting in yourself. So i i'm I'm in Rome because I'm safe from my pride here, even in a crisis yeah yeah, yeah I mean that I mean that kind of relates to my second reason for not being a orthodox as I was studying through the issue you know and I had friends and buddies who went on to become Eastern Orthodox. I have a friend who went on to become an Eastern Orthodox priest 
Antiochian priest. And uh, I really looked into Western Rite Orthodoxy with the Antiochians because there's actually where I was, an, uh, I was an Episcopal priest in Fort Worth, Texas. There's a Western Rite Antiochian Orthodox Church that's that's pretty big, sizable. I think one of the more prominent ones, St. Peter's Western Rite Orthodox here in town. And I went to, I remember going to Easter Vigil there once and got to know the priest and and attended their their mass, what they called a mass there, uh, many times and was attracted to that. But one of the things I noticed besides all the practical, moral, and doctrinal discrepancies between, and I, and when I got together with Orthodox, they would um, they would kind of bash each other, like the Russians didn't like the Antiochians, and everybody thought the Greeks were liberals and no good, right? <laughs> Uh, everybody looked down, you know, you know, apparently, apparently Greek Orthodox had some altar girls here and there. And so there's always these kind of differences. And there was this, it was kind of like, uh, being around people talking about the NFL, like, you know, the Packers are better. No, I like the Vikings. No, the Cowboys, you know, like they're all united in their love for football, but there's these deep rivalries where you don't sense the, the unity. But what I, what kind of hit me as I studied this is Eastern Orthodoxy is a withered branch since 1054, but especially since the fall of Constantinople, orthodoxy has not grown. People will say, oh, they'll give you all these numbers, but those, especially those numbers are based primarily on Russia and the Russian Orthodox. And those numbers are insanely overrepresented, represent, represented. Uh, also, if you go and look, and just Google right now, folks, go look on the OCA, Orthodox Church in America. Look at their censuses. They have been losing, decreasing in numbers over the last 20 years, especially over the last 10 years. They can't keep their people. Liter Divine liturgy attendance is down. Membership is down in the OCA. Did you know that, Timothy? Uh, no, I didn't know that. I, I, I believe, because basically in America, <clears throat> there's... Uh... There in every, or at least many Orthodox parishes, there's a strong ethnic core, yep. and then there's a bunch of Protestant converts. Correct. And I, the Protestant converts, they're on fire. I'm sure they'll continue for yes. a while. But <clears throat> the ethnic groups, it's just like it, just like the Catholics. You know, this same yep. thing happened 50 years ago with the Catholics. I mean, they were all Irish and Polish churches mm -hmm. or whatever. But then all these forces, you know, got together and just wiped that out. And that that strong ethnic identity that was tied to the religion was was just it couldn't stand up to secularism or it wouldn't rather and i think the orthodox really that it, it's even worse because there's such a strong it's a lot stronger than the catholics because at least the catholics had uh, a unifying identity even in their ethnicities but right for the eastern orthodox there's not as strong of that unifying identity so i see all the ethnic children you know the second generation and third generation they don't know the language anymore they're not as interested in the faith anymore you know, they're the ones falling away. And I, I mean, so I, I completely would get that. Um, and I think that that's, <clears throat> that's another function of the universal Roman primacy. When you see the history, you know, first our fathers converted the barbarians. We converted all the European um, tribes to Catholicism. And, and then we continued and we just started bringing the gospel to the ends of the earth. And we exactly. were converted— Everybody, and that's when of the when of the Greek right. Orthodox ever done that, right? And and to be to be fair, they did. I mean, they've been under Mohammedan and communist oppression for many years. But there's um and there's like an there's an Alaskan mission. The Russians went to Alaska, but there's not there's just such a strong insular identity, and right. there's not the and part of this is they don't have as many uh, unmarried priests. I that's mean, the they, thing they celibacy. <laughs> In you know, before we had all these homo scandals, celibacy fosters a missionary impetus to foreign lands. Right, you can send a ton of celibate priests. Yeah, a no married problem. guy with eight kids who's a pre he's Russian Orthodox priest, he can't go to the Philippines. Right, so that's that's something that stunts that. Um, right. So there's there's a number of different factors, but it's you can't discount the fact that there is that insular. Um, lack of universal identity as well. It's a strong factor. Yep. That missionary zeal for the gospel, bringing the gospel, converting all nations, that's only present in Rome to the extent that it is. I and mean, there's no match to it.
Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, I mean, it seems to me that, that orthodoxy globally, and I guess, I mean, to be honest, we could also say this about Catholicism, that we seem to be in a, 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 uh, perhaps a decreasing situation. I don't really know. I mean, I know like in Europe, it's dying so fast. You know, numbers are looking really bad. Even in America, numbers, when you look at nuns, monks, priests, marriages, infant baptisms, all these things were in a decline. So I don't say it's a an argument for sure, but it just seems that the powerful tools that the East once has, that bat belt, you know, that they wore and were able to do things, <laughs> they've lost... Uh, a substantial amount of their tools and then they can't really do anything. You know, they look like they are inwardly divided. They aren't doing evangelization or missionary work. And in their homelands, they've decreased and, and dried up. Look at the ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople. He, I mean, what is he over? Is he, I mean, Asia Minor is gone. Constantinople is gone. These places are complete, even, uh, you know, in Egypt, God bless them, the Coptics are, have been strong against the Mohammedans. But, you know, Islam is overrun. The Middle East, Palestine, Syria, all these places. Russia is really their last hope. And right. although they have made a recovery since communism, still there's, I mean, you want to talk about infiltration. The Russian church was infiltrated. You know, right. KGB bishops throughout. So, I mean, I see in the comments right now, Orthodox people are in here right now and they're, you know, they're talking trash, but look at your own house, guys. I know we have a big mess over in Rome right now. The Vatican's a mess. We got sexual scandals, financial scandals. But when I look over at Eastern Orthodoxy, I mean, that house is on fire. Right. I mean, you've got, <clears throat> just look at Pius X. Um, Pius X successfully, successfully drove all the modernists underground and unified the church. Not everybody liked it, but he did it. And that's what you do. So, um, <clears throat> you know, you call even the last two ecumenical councils, even though, you know, Vatican II, we've got issues or whatever, but they happened. You know, you call a council and it happens. I mean, we, the, the game plan, even though, even though think the crisis is severe here, the game plan is simple. You just, the Pope just does it. You know, we call a council and we get it, you know, right now we're just suffering under Pope Francis and it, it may be for a hundred more years, but the game plan is very simple. Whereas you go back, well, how are you going to, you know, fix your problem, Eastern Orthodox? Well, then we'll just have a, we'll, in, in a, a debate will ensue about how to, you know, how to call a council as a council necessary. Um, what's how to all this, all these questions, they're not, there's not, uh, that potency to have that universal ecumenical binding church. Yeah. So that's, and that's, um, <clears throat> I mean, what I've experienced, and this is, Solovia talks about this, is that there's, there is a strong, there's just a fantasy. There's just a fantasy among Orthodox that they're united, that there's, oh, well, we've got Okino, uh, Economia, uh, where all our baptism are accepted, you know, oh, we all teach this, we all teach that, and all these, you know, there's, no, you don't all teach this, you don't all teach that. It's not true. You know, you're just sort of banking on this fantasy that there is the Orthodox Church and they all teach the Orthodox faith. And <clears throat> once you get past 787, it gets real murky. Yeah. And that's the reality. And but there's this this such a strong fantasy. And I think it's just I mean, my experience based on my own original sin, my own pride, I want that fantasy to be real so I can just continue right. trusting to myself. But that's the reality. The reality is is that division. And it's hard to see for many Orthodox converts, because if you're in America, you're like, oh, well, everybody's buddy, buddy. You know, I go to the Greek church, I go to the Russian church or whatever, you know, it's. But they're not. It, <laughs> I mean, well, so check it out. Worse, At the Western I mean, Orthodox, Antiochian, didn't I'd go hang out with OCA guys and they'd be like, yeah, Western right Orthodoxy by the, that's kind of heretical. Like, we don't approve of that. So you have Russian, you know, guys saying that the Western right orthodoxy is wrong. Yeah, I mean, the Western right is is a that's a very ex important example because um, if the if the if the Orthodox Church is if the Orthodox churches are the Orthodox Church, why can't they approve a Western liturgy for the Western lands? Because right. 
you know, they've had, I mean, they were in communion with Rome for a thousand years or so. So they had a Western liturgy in the one church. So, but they can't, they can't bring themselves to approve that. And even in the Western Rite liturgy, they start monkeying around with the liturgy because they, they start adding in, they yeah. added in an, an epiclesis because they, yep. they didn't believe in the consecration the same way, even though you read St. Ambrose, that's exactly what the Latin fathers say. The consecration happens at the words of the Lord. But there was, I mean, they're messing with the Western liturgy. They can't even, even the ones who accept the Western liturgy in its pure form, they have to add more to it to, to make it conformable to. So that's a really good example because, you know, in the, in the Roman church, we have how many rites that are approved from the apostles? Um, you know, there's 24 churches. There's the other Latin rites besides the Roman rite. Um, that go back to the apostles and that are all, all preserved, you know, notwithstanding our liturgical crisis. But there is basically the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom in, among the Chalcedonians, and it's hard for them to accept the Western liturgy as their own saints practiced it. You know, they accept these other saints in the West. So, yeah, it's there's not this universal Orthodox Church. It's a... These in, these isolated national churches, they're divided. That's the reality. Yeah. That's what we're coming, it, keep going and that's back. established even more because as you know, we're both Americans. In America, they're not there is no juridical unity. You you have in New York City, you have the, the, the Russian, you know, you got Rocor, you got OCA, you got Antiochian, you got Greek. There's all these different jurisdictions. In America, the Catholic bishops are all kind of in communion, there's a recognizable body. In when orthodoxy comes to America, there is nothing like that. There's overlapping jurisdictions and there's contradictions between the jurisdictions. So you can have the Greek bishop of, of New York and you can have the Russian bishop of New York. There is no Orthodox Church of America. I know there's an OCA, right? But right. the reason that there is no Orthodox Church of America is because the Patriarch of Constantinople wants that American money. <laughs> and the, right? And the Antiochians, they can't keep alive in Syria. They need that money from overseas. And so they don't become juridically. I mean, you go back to the church fathers, they would say you can't have three bishops in one city. Yeah, and to be fair, there are certain sort of exceptions in the Roman church regarding like the Eastern Catholics or right. different things like that. But um, in general, there's just one bishop, one diocese, you know, um, but the, uh, and it may sound like jurisdiction is not really that big of a deal, but the current formal schism among the Orthodox churches is a dispute over jurisdiction. And there's been, I mean, this is just, this schism has You're been going on. You're talking about the Russians and the Greeks today. Currently. Yeah. yeah. So there's currently the schism. Let's not forget that. There's, there's currently a, a schism between a group of the Orthodox churches and a, another group of the Orthodox churches. And this is simply a manifestation. That's that. This has come out. This is really the first time it's been this formal, I guess, but there's been other proxy schisms. Like 96, there was an Estonian schism. 19, or 1870 to 1945, the Bulgarian schism. Before that, you had, there's the uh, old calendarist schism. Before that, there is the uh, old believer schism, 1666. Um, but before that, even Moscow was proclaiming itself to be the new Rome, the third Rome right. in the 1550s. So all these disputes have been going on since this time. And um, these disputes over jurisdiction, it's never, I mean, this hasn't been resolved for 500 years. And they've been fighting over this about who has jurisdiction and how, and and they've been having these different schisms and everything. And that's that's the reality. Is is there? And that's sort of a fundamental thing. It's just this jurisdiction. You know, one bishop has a diocese. Jurisdiction. You know, um, there should be an overarching. You'd, you'd think they would have called an ecumenical council by now and it's resolved this forever, but no, they can't. So that's where we're at. Yeah. A few years ago, they tried to have a, they did, they weren't calling it an ecumenical council, but they were having a pan-Orthodox gathering. But I think, uh, didn't Moscow refuse to show up or something like that over the right. Ukrainians? Right. So, it, and even, it, you see this earlier, 2007, there is, there there's a the international ecumenical dialogue between Rome and Orthodox churches. The I believe it was the Moscow, the Moscow delegates walked out of it because they were disputing with the Greeks or whatever about jurisdiction. 
And then in 2016, they tried to have this pan pan orthodox synod, but then uh, Moscow didn't show up, uh, Georgia, Bulgaria, and Antioch as well. So, so the ecumenical patriarch says, "Oh well, what we decided there is binding on everybody." But then Antioch says, "No, it's not." Moscow's like, "What are you talking about?" You know, and then they're just continuing to dispute about it. So, um, and that I mean, they've been trying to get this thing together for what? decades and decades i don't uh, even remember about a thousand years I, last i checked <laughs> so it's just like i mean we, we can we can talk about vatican ii but vatican ii was called in 58 and then it happened in 62 so we got four years that it ha- you know we got all sorts of issues you know that this has been covered but the point is it happened like an ecumenical council happened and things were able to move forward if you know so that's that's what it comes down to, you know. If if you want to Orthodox churches, you want to dispute with us, we'll call an ecumenical council, unify yourselves, make your unified doctrine, so that we can have a discussion. And, because we and, can't and have a discussion. Some anathemas. Yeah. If you don't like Immaculate Conception, y'all call a council and anathematize that. Yeah, that's, this is what I came to is that I I didn't when I was reading as an Eastern Orthodox, I didn't, I didn't feel myself bound to anathematize any of these Roman dogmas. I was going through everything and I was like, well, the council of Blacarne rejected the filioque, but why is that uh, binding? Why, or why exactly? Why is that formulation? There's a, there's an Eastern Orthodox scholar, Peter Gilbert, who is, is just all about, you know, Peter Gilbert. Yeah. Yeah. He's, oh. he was Antiochian, right? I don't know what jurisdiction he is, but okay. he's an Eastern Orthodox who's basically trying to rehabilitate this figure named John Beckos, who argued that the filioque is Orthodox. And he, he's so he's trying to argue that the the filioque is entirely Orthodox. And and so even Callistos Mil- Ware admits that there are there are fi- there's sort of strict filio anti filioque Orthodox, and there's sort of right. uh, People who are like, ah, it's not, you know, we disagree with adding it, but it's it's orthodox, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. So, and to be fair, you know, I, you know, there are, you know, with this whole kind of conversation, we we can be fair and we can say, well, hey, there, you know, there have been excesses by Latins, obviously, right. you know, sure. I mean, of course, I mean, there's the, the Crusades, you know, soldiers went off and did massacres and sat Constantinople and all this, you know, obviously, yeah, there's tons of excesses. But the other thing that's so pervasive that I experienced was that there's such a strong spirit of unforgiveness mm. where people are holding these, you talk to these Orthodox and there's talk, they're talking about the sack of Constantinople in 1204. <laughs> I'm like, guys, yes, it was wrong, but let's, can we, can we move past this? Please? I mean, it's like, we're, we're you're going to die and go to judgment failing to forgive a crime that happened five, you know, seven, 800 years ago, you're, you're holding on to this. Like how, how are you going to, how are you going to face judgment with this, with this lack of charity and this lack of forgiveness? And that's, that's a very strong, just such a very strong, I mean, I think there's a, a strong father wound where, where they just blame so much on the Pope and they think that he just self aggrandized himself, sent all these crusaders to massacre them and, blatantly added the feel quay like he didn't even care about anybody and 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 there's just this such a strong uh animus towards the pope as a figure as an office and it's just such a strong spirit of unforgiveness that i I just can't get on board with that so yeah I, i it's it's sort of like a bunch of kids or teenagers and there's no dad yeah and they're all in the same family and I mean, I'd love for all all to be one, but you know, people are people are saying in the chat now. Well, look at Rome. You know, it's such a mess. Look at Catholicism. Are you saying that all the bishops in the United States are all of one faith and all in one agreement? Obviously not. That's obviously not the case. But the reason for that is because Rome is not doing her job. Rome is failing to fulfill her miss her mission and her vocation. The reason I'm a Catholic is not because the United States Bishops Conference has its house in order. Obviously, it doesn't. Watch this show every single week. We talk about this. We talk about the problems. The reason that I'm a Roman Catholic is that I believe that the Roman Catholic Church has the tools and the ability to resolve all of these things. Has it been resolved right now? No. It's more of a mess 
in 2020 than it was in 2019. But I believe that the tools, which is the keys, the Petrine office, is the means by which we will get out of this mess. We can't trash the Petrine office and then get out of this mess. That's the only way out. That's yeah. the only solution is the Petrine office. I look at the Eastern Orthodox. They don't have an answer for how to fix their problems or the Roman problems. Rome right. does have an answer. She's just not using it. In fact, she's she's working, in my opinion, working against the common good, against unity, against truth right now. And that's happened before in history. Right. Yeah. And the right. Exactly. That's I mean, we've dealt with bad posts before. It's it's rare, but there's been bad, evil popes, immoral popes, popes doing all sorts of things. Um, this is the book I'm writing right now is is the um, <clears throat> basically it's Eastern Orthodoxy and Protestantism. I hate to lump them together in all fairness, but I hate to do it. But I got to do it this time. It's a theology of negation. It's an ecclesiology of negation. They're they're whatever they agree on. It's just not Rome. You know, they yeah. they break from Rome, but then they can't figure out how to have a church government. Right. You know, Protestants break away, but they can't figure out how to. I mean, they haven't broken into just the Protestant church or the Eastern Orthodox one church. It hasn't just okay. Well, here's the alternative. There is right. no alternative to Rome. They haven't figured out how to. It's just a. It's just a. A negation. You know, and so that's that's what it comes down to, and and that I I can't um, I can't bind my soul and diet and face judgment based on negation. Right. I need I need a positive truth to hold on to, and yeah, that's the long and short of it. Um, Rome is in crisis, of course. Yeah, we all agree on that. Um, but you can't deny that the power is there. Right. That's what are you going to do? You're going to say the Pope doesn't have the power to do what Pius X did? No, because Pius right. X did it. Yeah. So, I mean, and and even moreover, like I said, 95% of the more faith and moral questions that are currently controversial are not actually controversial. You just need to read read these sources, then it all becomes clear. I mean, we, we can debate on these other matters, you know, that are brand new, but if, if all Catholics and Catholic bishops just all read the sources and read the basic magisterial teachings, um, we'd, we'd figure out 95% of these crises immediately, you know, and then we'd be unified and then we could actually, you know, actually deal with the 5%. Or even better, in five years from now, Pius, Pope Pius XIII issues the new syllabus of errors. Right. Boom. S problems are solved right. immediately. <laughs> He has that authority. As I don't see any way for the Eastern Orthodox to issue a syllabus of errors, a list of anathemas, uh, a creed, anything. They haven't they haven't produced anything since 787, and that's why I say the Eastern Church is a withered branch. It doesn't have the vitality and the life from a dogma dogmatic. You know their liturgy is beautiful. You know, even their even yeah. their vespers, all these things, they do well, and, and I think that's a grace from the Holy Ghost that's kind of kept them kept a certain vitality, so, some kind of life. You know, their liturgy, their sacramental life, but the other elements that are juridical, that seems to be completely withered and gone. Nothing there. Right. It it just goes back. I mean, if you're the if you're the council, of the, or if you're the Church of the Seven Councils, then where's the power of the Seven Councils that you once had to yeah. anathematize? to make universal canons there, they have to resort to all these different canons that are, you know, hundreds of years old that may or may not apply to the given situation that they're trying to apply it to. So then they just disagree on, well, this canon applies here or that canon applies here, you know, yeah. and it's just, it's just a big mess. And so they can't, they don't have that living authority that they once had with the ecumenical councils. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, well, this has been a good show. Thanks for, yeah. for sharing your story. Um, you know, I, I think that I, I like to keep talking about it. I, I like to come back yeah. and maybe talk about, you know, it'd be good to do a show, Timothy, where we go through, say, the Filioque and we oh, yeah, go we through talk. Palamas and we go yeah. through um, mm -hmm. Macula Conception and Original Sin and maybe Chrismation, whether it confers a character. These are the controversies between the 
the Eastern Orthodox Schismatic Church and the Roman Catholic Church. Um, so maybe we can do that in the future. Yeah, is that, and th those I mean, it's a lot that goes into each one of those. A lot of history, a lot of complexity, and a lot of different different questions. So yeah, that's that's a whole other show, even just one of those. So right, um, we just kind of focused on the sort of the ecclesiastical dogmatic objectivity of the situation. Um, but all of these, I mean, there's plenty of ink has been spilled on all of these questions for years. So definitely worth another show. Yeah, absolutely. Good. All right. Well, we'll sign off here before we do though. Um, check out Timothy's YouTube channel at meaning of Catholic. He records and uploads videos over there. Uh, subscribe. If you like this channel, uh, please subscribe, hit the subscribe button over December. A lot of people were unsubscribed. So Real quick, just check and make sure you're still subscribed and hit notification all. That way you'll get these live streams. This is live right now. Um, also, um, please like the video. That tells YouTube that you like the video. It'll share it with other people who are like-minded with you. Thanks to everyone who supports on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Dr. Taylor Marshall. Just mailed out a bunch of uh, signed books yesterday. So the new Patreon patrons, you'll be getting those probably by the end of the week or maybe uh, Monday. So thanks so much for everyone for your support. And of course, pray the rosary. Another difference, Eastern Church, I guess they have different Marian devotions, but the rosary is the weapon. It's what leads us to contemplate and think about the mysteries of Christ. And Our Lady's here to help us. So pray the rosary every day. If you're not praying the rosary every day, you are not on the team. Um, all right, what's well, close in, in prayer, Timothy? I'll, I'll pray the, the Hail Mary in Latin. You want to pray the second half? Sure. All right, let's do it. In nomine Patris, et Fidei, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Santa Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hora mortis nostre. Amen. Amen. All holy popes, Pray for us. Pray for us. All Eastern saints. Pray, pray for, for us. us. Nomini Patris et Fidei et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. All right, everybody. Thanks so much. God bless you. Happy Epiphany Tide. And we'll see you in videos to come. Timothy, hope you come back. We could talk more about uh, Eastern issues and other things. Sure, man. Absolutely. Right. Godspeed, everybody. Signing off. All right.